literally just one second, I'm going to be introducing author Melanie Benjamin. I am so happy that I get to talk to her. I have been really like dreaming about being able to interview her. She has written some amazing books, The Aviator's Wife, Swans of Fifth Avenue, and now her newest book, The Girls in the Picture. This book is amazing. It is better than amazing. It is so good. I I can't wait to tell her how much I love it, but I think she has everybody telling her that. So anyway, here is Melanie. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be speaking with author Melanie Benjamin about her brand new book, The Girls in the Picture. And this cover is crazy good. You want to hold that up and show everybody? Look at that. I love that picture. I've been seeing it everywhere, Melanie, everywhere. I I just, I was like, I have to read that book. And I am so happy I did. I was uh, reading it and listening to it on my whisper sync. And which is like how my life rolls now on WhisperSync. And I, I don't even know what that is. Sorry. Uh, no well, idea. Amazon has this little feature for everybody out there. If you buy the Kindle, you get the audio book for a certain amount of money, you know, for like, and then they sync. And so you can be reading and then you pull up Audible, get in your car and it takes you to right where you were. Oh, Okay. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. It's my life now. So anyway, <laughs> what I wanted to tell you is that the audiobook is so good. So people out there who love audiobooks, this audiobook is amazing. You will love it. I love both. I liked reading it. I love listening to it. It was amazing. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for saying yes. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> and you know, I was so when I asked you to come on here, I'd seen that you weren't feeling well on Instagram after yeah, your book I got tour. Flu on book tour. Um, it was inevitable, I think, this year with the, the flu epidemic and I was out for about three weeks straight all over the country. So yeah, it was inevitable, but I'm much better now. That's yeah. good. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. When I saw that on Instagram, I was like, Well, she was just out all over the country. How are you gonna yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are not, not enough antibacterial hand wipes in the world, <laughs> not enough vitamin C. It just, you know, you're, it, this this year it really felt um, inevitable that this would result. It, it always happens. You always get a little sick after book tour, but I was gonna say, this year. Just, you know, yeah. just the grind of the book yeah. tour, you yeah. know, being tired and in and out of hotel rooms and, you know. And I'm flying all the time and airports oh, all the time. Flying. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, so this book, I am so happy you wrote this book because I love old movies, okay? Oh. But I'd only ever gone back as far as like 1930. I never watch mm-hmm. silent movie. I don't know. I don't know why. But as I get older, I keep going back further. So, mm-hmm. you know, right now I'm, I was in the 30s. And when you introduced me, I mean, the book is about these two women, Mary Pickford, who I've, everybody I'm sure has heard of. I mean, her name is familiar for some reason. We know of her and know her yeah. picture. Even the picture of her, I'm like, yeah, I know who she is. But yeah. I did not know about screenwriter Frances Marion. And yeah. so I love that you brought her story to life. And it was just such a fun, I did not want this book to end. It was oh, such a fun so read. It was such a fun read. So how did you find out about that? Like, I love when you guys find these stories and it's like, how did you find their story? Um, you know, I don't know about other authors, but I am just insanely curious about a million things. And I'm always reading and, and, and watching old movies and going to museums and just, I just constantly want to learn and I'm always out there learning more about things. And you find yourself drawn to certain, um, sometimes certain people, sometimes certain eras. Hollywood has always been a favorite of mine. I think most of us are familiar with, like you say, the 1930s, 1940s, the kind of Hollywood MGM glamour factory. But I've always been fascinated with the early silent era just because of, there's such a raw energy to that period. Um, and it, it was an incredibly inventive, collaborative time. Um, nobody had any experience because they were making this up, literally, Every time somebody turned a camera a new way, they were inventing something. (laughs) And it was a very, in in a way, it was just so very different than it is today because it really kind of was a Mickey and Judy kind of, hey, kids, let's put on a show feeling where men and women together were creating this. And so there were opportunities for women initially that are no longer there today, although I hope the tide is turning. And so um, 
I just read a lot about this era. And then there was a book called Without Lying Down, which is the biography of Francis Marion. It's the first time I've heard of, I heard of Francis Marion. Um, I read it years ago. It's a wonderful book by a woman named Carrie Beecham. And um, it's the first time. I realized that Mary Pickford was more than just a pretty face. And it was the first time I heard of Frances Marion and all these other pioneering women of Hollywood. I discovered that these women whose names we've forgotten today, there are no awards named for these women, but they were just as responsible for inventing Hollywood as names like Cecil B. DeMille and Irving Thalberg and all those names. And the friendship between Mary Pickford and Frances Marion who was Mary Pickford's closest collaborator, the two of them together made Hollywood history, made enormously popular movies. Frances Marion was the first woman to win an Academy Award for Best Screenplay. She was the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood. Mary Pickford was the first female head of a major motion picture studio. This is not known about these women nope. and their friendship, which was incredibly supportive, allowed them to to succeed when men in their lives didn't want them to. This is a story I just really wanted to tell. Oh, and what a great story. I mean, like you said, when I looked them up, I mean, I, you know, I'm reading your book and I'm kind of looking, you know, at different things and watching some YouTube things because I became so intensely interested. And I was like, out of all the years that I've been going to see movies, why did I not know that Mary Pickford was part of United Artists. Like I, I Why were all those women's <laughs> names forgotten? Why? Why are the only names we remember from those eras tend to be the male names yes. like you know Louis B. Mayer and Sam Goldwyn and, and D.W. Griffith? Why don't we remember Lois Weber? Why don't we remember Dorothy Arsner? Why don't we remember you know it's it's very frustrating. Uh, but it's of course uh, just kind of what women in history have always had to struggle against. Our stories are always lost. And it's men's stories that are always told. And I, I, this is why I wanted to write that book. I know. Yeah. And, that, and that's what I loved about it was it's so inspiring, um, even for like for me, but I, for my daughters. It's like, see, women yeah. have been doing things for a really long time. And I had <laughs> yeah. no idea that the screenwriting, because I had no idea. She wrote The Champ. I had yeah. no idea. Uh, she wrote The Big House, and the which big is house. a great, great, great Francis right. Marion we're talking about. Yeah, um, Francis, right. <laughs> um, she wrote The Big House, which is a very gritty prison drama. Right. Kind of still, it was like the mother of all prison dramas, the template for which other prison dramas, you know, happened later. Francis Marion, a woman, wrote that story. Yes, we don't remember that, do we? No, yeah. but I, I love Mary Pickford's story because, of course, like I said, I only knew her the name. And I knew right. the picture of her, and I think everybody could recognize a picture of her because it's kind of, you know, famous. And, iconic. Yeah, iconic, yeah. right. She I mean, was, she was, I think you could say, like, call Mary Pickford, truly the first international movie star, I really think. And the first actress to ever be America's sweetheart, you know. Um, and I think that's where re people, if they remember her today, they do remember that part of her, for sure. And yeah. there's so much going on. You know, we got World War One. We got the, just the beginning of pictures. Like you said, nobody really knowing what they're doing. Everybody's just kind of inventing pictures. But I did not know that she was married to, and now I'm losing his name because, of course, I can't think. Um, I didn't know she was married to Douglas Fairbanks. Another familiar oh. name. And then I didn't realize why I knew his name. Like, it was familiar. <laughs> and then you're like, why is that familiar? I have no idea. Well, you know, yeah, they, they're, they're, um, Mary Pickford was married early to another actor and it was an abusive relationship and it was not a healthy relationship. And then she fell in love with the married Douglas Fairbanks, who was a very, very popular film star too. And it was certainly, you know, one of the first examples of an actress having to decide, you know, my public, my, my career, my love, my career, my life, because her career was based on such a very wholesome image. And she was so afraid of losing her fans if she married her true love, Douglas Fairbanks. But of course they did marry, and what happened was they became um, the first truly international celebrity couple. That's um, what I was gonna ask yeah, you. The Brangelina right? of their day. They <laughs> were mobbed wherever they went, yeah. Yeah, and it's. I was thinking like the first Liz Taylor, Richard Burton. You know, uh, yes, like exactly. That. Everyone everyone liked that Liz and Dick and yeah. um, gosh, you know, Brangelina and all those came. At Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks were the first. They were the first movie star power couple for yeah. sure. 
Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So it was like, I don't know, just reading it, I was like, wow, so this goes even back further than, you know, we think it starts in the 30s with, you know, yeah. Judy Garland and all, you know, and then it's like, yeah. no, it's even further back than that. Well, you know? well yeah, like a hundred years ago. I think they, they, they were married, I think it was in, it was in 1919 or 1920. Right. It was a hundred right. years ago that we're talking. You know, that's how long, movies have been around even longer, but that's how long Hollywood has been around as far as, you know, the Dream Factory and the celebrity couples. And like I said, Mary and Douglas, they um, and Francis, they all were kind of the first of all of, all, of everything that came after. Yeah. What I found interesting is that okay, so the first talking picture was like 1929, 1927, October 1927. And what was jazz that? singer? The, the jazz, jazz singer. Okay, right. Warner Brothers. So yeah. when they when they were writing these silent films. It interested me. Like, did they have, was there, there was just nothing, because I really don't know anything. So I'm just, I, I was going to look it up and then I'm like, I'm, I'm going to ask Melanie. I'm not <laughs> nervous, so, you know. Okay, okay. When they were writing these, like, so they're writing what they're going to be showing, which is really interesting. Like the screenwriters are writing what they're going to, because there's no talking, you know, there's no sound. Well, right. So there are a lot of similarities between the silent movie scripts and scripts today, because, you know, movie is still a visual medium as obviously it was in the silent era too right. and so yeah i mean they're you know they're talking about the camera pans we open on i mean they would talk especially in the later years of the silent films the camera work is very sophisticated um extremely sophisticated and so the camera moved there was the scripts addressed that um, they wrote dialogue in the scripts, actually, and um, the actors and actresses would often be, you know, they would say dialogue, but what we would see are what we call the intertitles. Okay. Right. And that is, and those weren't always written by the screenwriter, actually, there was usually a specialist who wrote the intertitles. So the dialogue was was not quite exactly what you saw in the intertitles. If you watch a lot of silent films, you see them speaking, um, and it, the, they trusted the audience to fill in a lot of blanks back then. Mm -hmm. um, so not every word spoken between the actors on screen was then displayed in the intertitle. You see, right. there was they did trust the audience to just kind of keep, keep up, you know, yeah. and fill in the blanks on their own. But yes, then the intertitles, that was... That was the dialogue you would see between, you know, as, you know, you would see the scene and then there'd be a little, you know, card with some spoken dialogue in it. The really important stuff to keep you up to date in the movie. But a lot of it didn't, you know, a lot of it was fluid and it didn't have those inner titles. So it's just interesting because so Francis starts off doing that and then ends up into, you know, like she was really a part of that transition. Yeah, she was, she got her first, she wanted to be a writer, um, Unlike a lot of young women who it was beautiful. She was a beautiful young woman. Um, and when she wanted to get into movies, she, unlike everyone, did not want to be an actress. She wanted to be behind the camera. She was more comfortable behind the camera. Women were actively courted to be screenwriters in those days. And actually, the term was not screenwriter. It was scenarist, spelled S-C-E-N-A-R-I-S-T. That was what they, the term they used for the people writing the movies. Um, half of the movies made in that period were written by women. So women were, again, sought out to be screenwriters. Uh, and she got her first job um, in front of the camera. She was hired reluctantly in front of the camera, but she really, really wanted to work behind it. And so her first job writing was to write made-up dialogue for the background, the extras, in a, in a scene, because... Um, Audiences were growing very sophisticated. We're talking about 1915, and they were reading lips on screen. And what happened is you would have extras in a scene. They'd be just talking, right? You know, yeah. nobody, and, and, and just saying things that were not suitable for families. <laughs> and so she was hired to write some actual dialogue for people in a party scene to say, so that when the audience would read the lips, they would actually be able to you know, they would be talking about something pertinent to the movie. That was her first job writing for the films. Wow, that's just crazy. Yeah. And you know, when you mentioned the fact that she wanted to be a screenwriter, one of my favorite quotes in the book as, is her chapter, is her talking about the fact that, you know, she wanted to be a writer because um, an actress, even an actress like Mary, had a fleeting shelf life. And yeah. 
you know, I was like, wow, she even got that. Like she yeah. got that that's how, it and you know, I don't know that it's so much like that anymore. I do think that actors. I think it is. I mean, I do think it is. Don't you? It, I mean, we are still finding it's women over 40, you know, it, women over 35 in Hollywood. It's tough. It's Especially tough. for some main, I always think of like, I'm thinking like uh, Frankie and Grace, like Jane Fonda has been able to like, you know, let her account. Yeah, her I, I think there, I mean, I love that show. I was just yeah. watching it today on the treadmill. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but I, it's still but rare. Whole, no, right, it's still whole. rare. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, yeah. then they'll just go get bad face work to try to extend the time. Yeah, well, that happened back then, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, you know, youth is always coveted. It is yeah. today. It what you know, youth is is celebrated. It was back then as well. Some things haven't changed. Frances, I think, was a uh, a little. You know, she understood that uh, longevity meant behind the camera, not in front of the camera. Now, you know, Mary also producing movies um, and running her own studio certainly. Um, ensured that she would still be involved in movies long after she retired as an actress. But she basically was retired from the screen at the age of 41. Wow. Yeah, yeah. and, you know, I, I'm thinking of, like, even the actress. Like I said, for her to understand that at that point for actresses, but then she didn't really say that about actors because I think for really, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. actors do have a very long... long they still so do, yeah. You and, know? you know, also compounding... Because I do think you can, you can kind of... Point pinpoint Mary Pickford as being the first actress trapped um, by her image and yeah. not allowed, um, you know, forced forced from the screen really because she was so identified with a particular image and in her case it was youth. It was the little girl with the curls. She played so many children, yeah. you know, well into her thirties. She was playing children, young women. That was her image. America's sweetheart, the girl with the curls. Um, the image that Frances Marion wrote for her, that was what that was what propelled her to international fame. It's also what trapped her and made it very difficult for her then to try to mature into roles befitting her age. So um, I think she is kind of the first casualty. It, you know, if you want to talk about actual actresses sometimes being casualties of their images, I think Mary is probably the first example of that. Well, while I was reading it, I was thinking, like, the research you had to do to get, you know, it was just, you know, to span basically their whole lives, you know, I was, mm -hmm. how long did that, I mean, historical fiction always takes, I mean, the research is always the largest part of, of I, you know, I, it. Never, it, I don't think it takes that long. I okay, love great. it. I, I mean, I'm, I, like I said, I've always been fascinated with this era. I read books many years ago about this era. So when I decide to write about something, it's usually because I have a pretty strong sense of the time and the place and the facts anyway. Right. So it's not like I'm starting from scratch, having to learn everything about it. I, I, I'm starting with a pretty good base of knowledge so that the research and again, this is just me being a lifelong history nerd, right. um, reader of everything. I stick my nose in every kind of book. I'm interested in every little thing. I mean, that's just me. I'm a very curious person about everything. That has come in very handy as, an, as a writer. Yes. Um, so my research process isn't quite as extensive as a lot of people seem to think it is. I mean, it really is only a couple months of just reading everything I can, yeah. um, watching a lot of old movies in this case. I <laughs> go out to Hollywood. Um, I went to the Margaret Herrick Library, which is part of the Douglas Fairbanks Center, right. which is all part of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. You know, the Academy, that, that they do the Academy Awards, but they're also, you know, a huge, they have many, many different centers all over Southern California devoted to preserving Hollywood film and history and education and reference. And so I did go to that reference library and I looked at some of the scripts that Francis had written, wow. and that um, some of the receipts Mary had as did they have uh, original it, scripts. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, wow. so that was fascinating to look at those scripts from the silent era and then the early sound era. The scripts she wrote, it was very fascinating to see. You know how she taught herself a new way of writing, basically. Wow. Uh, so yeah, so I did all that, but it is only a only a couple months, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, yeah, I don't I'm look at it as work. It's just I get to I get to indulge my curiosity, you know, yeah. and call it 
call it a job. So I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I was thinking I'd been to the Chinese Groman, you know, with the hands and, and feet. But yeah, for, saw, and Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks were the first ones to put right. their hands and feet in the cement there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I wish I, I was so young when I went there. I wish I would have, you know, if I go back, I'm definitely looking. I'm looking for her, you know, because she yeah. seems so tiny. I don't know. It, her picture seems so tiny. So she was not even five feet. She was. She was a tiny, petite, young, you know, woman. Of course, I, you know, everyone back then was smaller. I think we always say that. Douglas Fairbanks was not a very tall man. Charlie Chaplin was extremely slender and short. Um, You know, they weren't movie stars like you've got a John John Wayne, you know, who was like six feet or something. But um, they were all kind of, you know, Gloria Swanson was a tiny little person. (laughs) back then (laughs) they were all very small but they looked very big on film yeah well I just remember you know because I'd gone back to the 30s even reading um about Judy Garland and she always went because she started tiny they always wanted her to stay tiny yeah I don't know if that happened for Mary Pickford I don't know if she struggled with that having that image of having to stay well I mean she certainly did um it she was an artist and she tried to stretch herself as her film in, in, into the twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she didn't always play little children. You know, I think that is the enduring image of Mary Pickford is a little girl on screen in films like Pollyanna, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, A Little Princess. These are all films that Frances Marion and she collaborated on that Frances wrote for Mary. Um, that was always how the public wanted her. She did push herself. She tried to make other films where she played older women, where she played, she played um, young, you know, more contemporary women. But those films were never as, as successful right. as the ones in which she played the little girl. So every once in a while, then she'd go back and she'd play the little girl on film to give her public what they wanted. I mean, Mary had a, a very impoverished childhood mm-hmm. and she was responsible financially for everyone in her family, her two brother, her brother and sister and her mother. So um, she was just really always terrified of, of losing it all. So she was always willing to give her public what they wanted, right. even if it meant portraying little girls long past the time she should have as both a person, as an artist too. Yeah. yeah, and it was. I like to see the fact that they made a lot of money, like for for that time. They did. Like they made, they did make like. Yeah, they, they did. did, and Mary particularly, um, Francis and her husband. Unfortunately, they spent every cent that they got. You know, they really bought into the Hollywood lifestyle, but with a healthy sense of you know this can all go away tomorrow. Um, but Mary was extremely uh, a smart businesswoman, and she invested all over the place They're in real estate, oil wells, buildings all over uh, California. She, so she was a very smart businesswoman. So even when she wasn't making movies, she was still able to live, you know, very, very, very well. But, you know, one of the interesting things about Mary Pickford is that, you know, not everyone who got their start in the early years of movies did have her wealth or were able to invest and save. And in the 1950s, 1940s and 50s, when a lot of those people from the early years were starting to be older and have health problems, they didn't all have the money that Mary Pickford had. So she was instrumental in starting the Hollywood Motion Picture Home, which is where... Still today, people who've worked in the industry, they are able to have health care. They're able to have assisted living, um, you know, medical assistance in their later years. And Mary Pickford started that. And I just think that's one, another amazing thing that she did. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, this mm-hmm. was so much fun. I mean, that, like I said, that book was so much fun. And you've written some incredible books. Okay. <laughs> Over the, Thank the, you. The, Thank the, you so the Aviator's Wife, The Swan Fifth <laughs> Avenue. I mean, and then this book and they're, they all do so well. And like, what's your next book? I wish I could tell you. I can't. Um, It is another historical fiction. Um, It is based on a real couple, but you don't know them. These are not famous people, but where they lived and the time in which they lived is 
fairly well known and famous. And that's as much a part of the book as the people themselves. And that's all I can say at this point. Well, you know what? I always, when I read a book as good as this, I always think about, oh, I hope they make it into a movie. And then I was like, with this one, it's like, this has got to be a miniseries. This can't be a movie. <laughs> like, they can't do all that. It would be like a four hour movie. To no, get no, yeah, I mean, I do think that miniseries and, you know, right now on streaming platforms, that's really where women's stories are being told that's right now. And that kind of is the sweet spot. So, uh, we, yeah, I, there's interest. That's all I can say. There's certainly interest, and hopefully we can announce something soon. Well, you know, and everybody's loving these historical, like, going back. Everybody wants to go back, and that's why I was like, this is perfect. People don't yeah. know this story. This is No, like, but, it, but yet it's so timely because of women in Hollywood today. Yes. You know, here we are so talking timely. about Mary Pitchford and Frances Marion making the most popular movies coming out of Hollywood a hundred years ago and look where we are right now where we're just trying to regain all that ground and as we said at the beginning talking about these women whose names are lost to history again I, I this the lack of women's voices in Hollywood and women reclaiming you know their voices and making their voices heard again plus the casting couch which was certainly around back then and we talk about it in my book for sure I mean it all kind of ties in so even though this is set a hundred years ago there are so many issues that are very timely right now at this moment in time well I'm really yeah. happy to hear that there's interest because I, I think it would be sure. perfect so can you show everybody the book again because I want to show oh, off sure. that cover yes. because this cover is so good look at that are you happy with it I mean oh I yes always just, yes yeah yes. I think uh, well all of your covers have been so good but I just love the color of that yeah right it's now. beautiful it's, and I want their dresses I want that oh, floral dress it's so I beautiful. know it's like taking it back you're like I want to dress like that that's so yeah beautiful. yeah wouldn't that be nice <laughs> yeah well I can't wait for the next book thank you so much Melanie yeah. and I will have all of her links listed underneath here you can find her everywhere her, this book is everywhere everybody's talking about it so i'm so happy for you thank you so much michelle thanks for the opportunity okay we'll talk soon thank you okay bye Thank you everyone for watching that interview with melanie wasn't that just amazing oh my god i am so so blessed that i was able to talk to her um that book is great if you guys love anything about the movies you've got to read this book because it, it it just goes back into the history of it and makes me want to go watch some silent films which I didn't think I'd ever want to do because I really never got it but I can't wait to go watch some but anyway if you made it this far I just want to thank you for watching this interview um, if you liked it please hit like if you'd like to get an update every day about my videos that go out every day but Sunday, um, hit subscribe and thank you again.